So it's a great pleasure to have um, uh, Adam Buland here um, from Stanford uh, to talk about uh, quantum pseudo entanglement. So Adam got his PhD at MIT, and then he was a postdoc uh, at the Simons Institute before moving on to Stanford. So his um, his research is in um, in um, quantum complexity theory, quantum computation, but with a with a definite view to uh, to um, to the foundations of physics. Um, and uh, he's done lots of work on random circuit sampling and quantum supremacy, but also, also on this, uh, also work on um, uh, you know quantum pseudo randomness and black holes. Uh, um, so, um, Adam, looking forward to your talk today. Great, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. So I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. Uh, let's see here. Wait, actually, is this? Uh, let's see here. Great. Can you now see my just the slide? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Yeah. So thanks so much for the uh, for the invitation. Uh, so I'll be talking today about uh, some recent work I had on quantum pseudo entanglement, um, and this is based on joint work with Scott Aronson, Bill Pfefferman, uh, Shomit Ghosh, Umesh Vazarani, Chen Yi Zhang, and Jack Joe. So the starting point for this for this talk is the notion of classical randomness. So in classical algorithms, randomness is often viewed as a resource for classical computation. Like for example, if you are you know trying to run the sort of algorithm that involves hashing to have quick lookup for for some sort of functional search problem, then you might want to do something like pick a random hash function h from n bits to n bits. Right. But the common issue that you face in these algorithmic applications is that you often have access to only a limited number of truly random bits. Like, for example, you know, describing a truly random hash function requires exponentially many random bits. You might not have access to that many bits or that much computation time to define a, a truly random function. Right. So the way that this is usually solved in classical computing is via pseudo randomness, where the basic idea is that you can efficiently spoof random bits with much less randomness than you might naively think is required. Like more formally, the idea is to take a very small uh, random seed S, which might be say a polylogarithmic length and expand it to an n bit seed, an, an n bit string R of S in such a way that the induced distribution on n bit strings is indistinguishable in some way from that of a truly random n bit string. Right. And the first time you see this, this might seem somewhat counterintuitive, right? Like there's very little entropy in this distribution. You know, there's only poly log bits of entropy instead of n bits of entropy, right? So there are only a very small number of isolated strings in this ensemble. But nevertheless, it's still possible to construct pseudo random, uh, you know, pseudo random uh, generators, you know, in, in various different sorts of security guarantees. So, you know, uh, sometimes people consider pseudo randomness with respect to information theoretic forms of security. So this is usually called like KY's independent distributions. You know, these are distributions on n bits that look random if you only look at a subset of K of the bits. But if you look at more of the bits, they might have some more sorts of correlations there. Right. And there's, of course, also the computational form of pseudo randomness, which is the which is uh, ensembles of random strings are indistinguishable from truly random strings to any efficient algorithm. Right. This is the notion of a pseudo random generator. Right. And what's nice about both of these uh, you know, types of constructions is that they use exponentially less randomness than, than you would think would be naively required to have at random bits. All right. And, you know, this gives rise to a large number of applications, you know, cryptography and algorithms, as well as in complexity theory in the form of, say, de-randomization. Now, when we move to quantum algorithms, entanglement plays a similar role as a resource for quantum computation. For example, we know that uh, entanglement is a necessary resource, you know, it's a necessary ingredient if we want to achieve a quantum algorithmic speed up. Like, in other words, if you have a quantum computation that doesn't produce very much entanglement, um, it's in, in many circumstances easy to simulate that classically. Okay. Now, of course, the role of entanglement in quantum computing 
is not exactly analogous to the role of randomness in classical computing because quantum entanglement um, is in some ways a little more rich and a little more subtle than classical randomness. Like for example, we don't know a way to pull the entanglement out of a quantum algorithm in the same way that we know how to pull the randomness out of a classical algorithm, right? And moreover, you know, there are many different types and measures of entanglement that, that, that one can consider. Right. But nevertheless, in this work, we we try to ask the following question, you know, is it possible in any setting to spoof entanglement in the same way that classical pseudo randomness allows you to spoof random numbers? Right. And our main result is that the answer is yes, like it actually is possible to spoof entanglement uh, in a way that's that's somewhat analogous to 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 classical pseudo random uh, generators. Right. So in more detail, in this work, we describe a new notion that we call pseudo-entanglement, right? And what's the basic idea of pseudo-entanglement? Well, at a high level, it's ensembles of efficiently constructible quantum states. You know, one ensemble has lots of entanglement, like very high entanglement, another ensemble with very low entanglement, but these two ensembles are indistinguishable to any efficient quantum algorithm, right? And in this work, we not only define this notion of pseudo-entanglement, but we also give the first construction of pseudo-entangled states, which, which have an exponential reduction in the amount of entanglement. In other words, we can exponentially, you know, we can hide an exponential amount of entanglement with, with our constructions. And, uh, you know, this, you know, we achieve this reduction in entanglement in a variety of different measures. So in particular, we give an exponential reduction in the Schmidt rank. So this implies, you know, immediately exponential reductions in, you know, essentially any other entanglement measure like uh, von Neumann entropy or uh, any other sort of entropy you'd like to consider. Okay. And of course, this, this will, as we'll describe, this, this new construction is only possible with through a computational lens. Like it's only possible if you take a computational view of security. And our work is inspired by a prior paper of Giorgio and Huben, which considered a, a similar notion. And I'll discuss that more in detail uh, later in the talk. Okay. And just to give you the, the punchline of the talk, uh, at, at the beginning, in particular, what we'll show is that the following sorts of quantum states are pseudo entangled. So they're states that look like this. They're in equal superposition over all strings in some subset, where we then apply a random phase f of x, like this is a plus or minus one random phase to that element of the subset. And in particular, we show that if you choose the set S pseudo randomly, and you choose the binary phases pseudo-randomly via a, a pseudo-random function, then we will prove that these states are, are pseudo-entangled. The basic idea is that by changing the size of the subset that you're creating an equal superposition of, this will give us a, a knob we can turn to change the entanglement of these states in a way that we'll be able to hide from any polytime observer. Moreover, we'll also show that these states are pseudo-random states. That is to say, they're also indistinguishable from the from Haar random states as well, right? And a little later in the talk, I'll describe some new applications of this new construction, uh, namely to some new property testing bounds for matrix product states uh, and new other sorts of property testing bounds to learning Schmidt rank, uh, and even some applications to quantum gravity as well. All right, great. So to understand our construction, it's helpful to start with a bit of background uh, on the notion of quantum pseudo-randomness, right? So a common goal in quantum algorithms is to spoof the Haar measure on states or unitaries. That is to say, we want to create some ensemble of, of unitaries or states that, that is indistinguishable in some ways from the Haar measure. Right. So why is this interesting? Well, it turns out that you know it's a very common algorithmic technique to consider taking Haar averages in the course of your algorithm. Like some examples of this are you know uh, randomized benchmarking where you take Haar averages 
to uh, to diagnose errors on the quantum computer or uh, efficient shadow tomography protocols where you want to ideally measure your system in some different hard random bases and collect statistics on it in, in order to, to reproduce some measurement statistics of the state. Right. But the common issue in these applications is that you know, you cannot efficiently generate har random states or unitaries in polynomial time. Right. There is a standard counting argument that says if you want to create an n qubit har random state, this is a this is a task that requires two to the n uh, lo local gates on your quantum device. So the common solution is to uh, find different ways of efficiently spoofing the har measure. So more formally, you create ensembles of what are called pseudo-random quantum states, which have very short quantum circuits, but are nevertheless indistinguishable from hard random states in a certain sense. So the most common way of creating kind of quantum forms of pseudo-randomness is to create information-theoretic forms of pseudo-randomness, and these are called T-designs. So more formally, a quantum T design is an ensemble of quantum states such that no algorithm can distinguish T copies of a random state from the ensemble from T copies of a hard random state, right? So there is an alternative definition, which says that, uh, you know, it's equivalent to saying that you match the first T moments of the hard measure. Right, so this is an information theoretic form of pseudo randomness, and it has many important applications, you know, in in randomized benchmarking, efficient shadow tomography, um, et cetera, et cetera. And what's nice about quantum T designs is that there exists many efficient constructions of T designs. Like, for example, we know that random Clifford circuits are a three design. Or you know, sufficiently deep random circuits are are, are T designs. You know, the, there's a, a rich literature exploring how to create efficient forms of information theoretic quantum pseudo randomness. Yeah. But there's an alternative way of thinking about quantum pseudo randomness, which is a little more natural from the computer science lens, which is to consider a form of computational pseudo randomness, right? That is to say, to consider ensembles of efficiently preferable quantum states that are nevertheless indistinguishable to, from hard random states by any efficient quantum algorithm. All right. So this is a notion that was first defined by G, Leo, and Song in 2018. And since then, we found a wide number of applications of, of, of computational pseudo-randomness in the quantum setting as well. So, of course, if you're making a computational security guarantee, you're going to have to make some sort of computational assumption in order to get these states. But what Gilio and Song said is showed is that this actually requires only very mild cryptographic uh, assumptions, namely that there exists some sort of one-way function that's secure against quantum attack. Right. So this is a really different notion of pseudo-randomness than the usual notion of a unitary T-design, right? So in one sense, you might think that this notion of computational pseudo-randomness is just a weaker notion than a T-design, right? So like if you compare the security guarantee of a T-design versus the security guarantee of a computational pseudo-random state, you know, the security guarantee of, of the computational pseudo-randomness is weaker, right? It's just saying no efficient algorithm can distinguish these ensembles of states. Whereas for T-designs, it's saying no algorithm period could, could distinguish these states. But it turns out you can actually get something a little stronger out of computational pseudo-randomness, which is that uh, you can actually show that you can actually get security even against arbitrary polynomial number of copies of the state, which, which is not possible with a T design. Like with the T design, once you fix your T design, you know, T copies of the state are information theoretically distinguishable, indistinguishable from random, but not necessarily T plus one copies, right? So you're kind of locked in on the number of copies there. Okay. So in this work, one question that we ask is, what is the relationship between quantum pseudo-randomness and entanglement? Right. So if you look at a typical Haar random state, and you divide it on n qubits, and you divide it in, in two, the entanglement entropy that you have between the left 
n over two qubits, and the right n over two qubits is nearly maximal. And in fact, you know, the maximum possible value is n over two. You can show that the 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 entanglement entropy is typically n over two minus some very small constant. Right. Now, similarly, you can show that T designs are also maximally entangled as well for any T greater than or equal to two. So actually, a quantum T design, while you know it can give you a big savings in terms of, say, circuit complexity, it does not give you any savings in terms of entanglement, right? So, so T designs are actually are also maximally entangled. So what about if you have computationally pseudo-random states, right? Well, in this, in the case of computational pseudo-randomness, the only thing we knew about pseudo-randomness and entanglement prior to our work was a, a lower bound on how much entanglement pseudo-random states have to have. And that lower bound was is just that they have to have a super logarithmic amount of entanglement entropy um, across most cuts of the state, right? So you can see that there's an exponential gap between how much entanglement there is in the Haar random state and how much entanglement we know we knew that we needed in order to have a computational form of pseudo-randomness. Right. So a natural question to ask is, you know, if you have computationally pseudo-random states, you know, where do they lie in the spectrum? Like, can you make pseudo-random states that have, you know, only say log squared n entanglement entropy? Right. Like, is it even possible for, for this sort of object to exist? Right. And our main result in this language is that surprisingly, yes, it is actually possible to construct computationally pseudo-random states. Uh, with very low amounts of entanglement, which actually fully saturate this JLS lower bound, right? So more formally, what we show is something like this. We show that there exist ensembles of pseudo-random states where if you take any cut of the state, right, like any division of, of the state into two subsets of qubits, and you look at the entanglement entropy across that cut, that entanglement entropy can be as low as merely polylogarithmic in N, right? So that is to say pseudo-random states can have, you know, computationally pseudo-random states can have exponentially less entanglement than, than T designs, right? So this is something that's not possible in an information theoretic setting. You, you have to take a computational lens in order to achieve something like this. And what's nice about our construction is that it only relies on standard cryptographic assumptions, namely there that there is a one-way function uh, se se secure against quantum attack. And moreover, we can also make our pseudo-randomness kind of tunable. Like we can set the entanglement and en entropy across any cut to any function that you like, uh, as long as it's strictly between log n and n. Right. So there's nothing special about log squared n in our construction. Like you can actually set the entanglement kind of anywhere on the spectrum that, that, that you like, you know, within the kind of permissible boundaries of, of, of computational pseudo randomness. OK, so this in some ways looks like classical pseudo randomness, right? Like in classical pseudo randomness, you're asking how much entropy do you need in a classical probability distribution to mimic the uniform distribution, right? Classical pseudo randomness says, well, you know, only polylogarithmically many bits of entropy are needed uh, under classical cryptographic assumptions, right? And, you know, our work is getting a similar exponential gap but for entanglement entropy, instead of the usual notion of, of, of you know, Shannon entropy for, 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 for random bits. Of course, there's an important caveat here that distinguishes our result from classical pseudo-randomness, which is that, you know, uh, we're, we're only spoofing the entanglement of certain families of quantum states. Um, you, know, you know, so this doesn't have the same application for, you know, like like PRGs have for de-randomization, but it's very similar in spirit in the terms of achieving this exponential reduction in some measure. So I think it, you know, the way to think of it is like it's this first point of exploration of the space of what sorts of entanglement you you, you can efficiently spoof. All right, great. So I'm going to discuss some applications of our result uh, later in the talk. Um, 
but to start with, I'm going to give you a, a, a first, I'm going to give a proof sketch of how it's even possible to create these sorts of states that have very low entanglement and yet nevertheless look like hard random states, right? Mm -hmm. So the starting point for our construction is the phase state pseudo random state construction of G, Leo, and Song, um, and uh, a, a variant of which was later proved pseudo random by Brikursky and Shmueli. So in particular, we consider states of the following form. So let's consider states that are in equal su superposition over all strings, where in each for each, you know, uh, for each basis vector of the superposition, we will apply a pseudo random plus or minus one phase to the state. Okay. So the main result of these prior works was that these states are already a, a computational, you know, pseudo random state ensemble or a PRS, uh, assuming that your, your, your phases are, are a quantum secure, are given by some quantum secure pseudo random function. Right. So, like, what, what, why are these a, 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 a computationally pseudo random state? Well, first of all, it's easy to see that, uh, it's relative, it's very easy to prepare these states, right? Like, uh, you know, if you want to prepare the state, all you need to do is first Hadamard all your qubits to create an equal superposition over strings, and then apply your pseudo random function in superposition to the state, right? As a phase oracle. So these are manifestly easy to produce. Uh, so the more the more interesting direction was uh, that they showed is that you know if you didn't know the secret key of your PRF then no efficient quantum algorithm can distinguish polynomially many copies of these random phase states from poly many, polynomially many copies of a Haar random state. So more formally, any efficient quantum algorithm A has a negligible you know, probability of distinguishing a state from this ensemble versus a state from the Haar ensemble. Right. And that was the main result of these prior works was to establish this first, you know, this first pseudo random uh, state construction. All right. So in our construction, you know, it, okay, if you look at this construction, you know, it's not really obvious what the entanglement entropy of this construction might be, right? Like, uh, like uh, the, the, the entanglement entropy, you can relate it in some way to, uh, some matrix defined based on the entries of the pseudo random function, but uh, but you know the entanglement properties of, of of this state are not are not directly related to the pseudo randomness property of the function. So it's not immediately clear how these states are related to entanglement. Right? So in order to create low entanglement pseudo random states, we create uh, a different version of this construction, uh, which is a new pseudo random state construction that we call the subset phase state construction, right? So what's the basic idea? We consider some states that we call subset phase states, which look like the, the, the JLS uh, pseudo random state construction, but instead of being supported on all in-bit strings, our states are instead only supported on a subset S of the n-bit strings, right? Uh, so within that subset, we still apply pseudo-random phases to the state, but the subset itself, you know, say what might be chosen in, in some sort of random or pseudo-random fashion that, that we'll describe shortly, right? So our, again, the phases are just, you know, similar to JLS, they're just given by some quantum secure pseudo random function. Right. So why are these phase states, you know, nice to look at when you're considering entanglement? Well, a nice thing is that if your states are only supported on the subset of basis strings of size, you know, norm of S, then clearly the Schmidt rank of the state across any cut is automatically less than or equal to the number of states in your superposition, right? So in other words, the size of the subset, the size of the support of these subset phase states naturally is an upper bound on the amount of entanglement in these states, right? 
So this is closely related. You, know, you may have seen some states like this before in quantum information. Like, you know, uh, there are a lot of places where uh, a closely related construction has been considered called pure, you know, just subset states. So these are states where you consider an equal superposition over all elements uh, in the subset without any phases. You know, these have been studied many places, like, for example, quantum money, uh, variants of QMA based on subset states. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in fact, they were even previously suggested as a potential pseudo-random state construction by G. Leo and Song. Um, but uh, for various technical reasons I'll describe later, uh, you know, we, we end up adding the phases to these states. So these are kind of, you know, the states we're considering are somewhere between subset states and the random phase state constructions, right? Okay. And the main result of our work is we show that pseudo-random subset states uh, are, pseud are indeed pseudo-random, even when they have really, really small subset sizes. That is to say, even when the subset size is, say, merely super polynomial in N, right? Which is exponentially smaller than the size the subset could be, right? So more formally, what we show is the following result. Right. If you have any function f of n that's between log n and n, then if you create subset phase states with pseudo-random subsets of size 2 to the f of n and pseudo-random phases, then these are a, a, a computationally secure pseudo-random state construction, right? So by dialing the size of the subsets we consider, we can create you know, any amount of entanglement we want, right? And you know, what's nice about this is that the entanglement entropy of these states is low across any cut of the state simultaneously, right? So, as you know, as immediately corollary, this means that there exists computationally secure PRSs with entanglement entropy f of n across every single cut of the state uh, at the same time, right? And uh, moreover, we can also give a lower bound on the entanglement entropy to you know, of omega f of n as well. So like we can achieve a very, you know, we can make this entanglement tunable in the sense by, by increasing the subset size and by, by playing some games with, with, with how we pick the pseudo random function as, as well. Uh, I won't get into details of, of this lower bound, but in the rest of the talk, I'm just going to focus on establishing the entanglement upper bound, since I think that, 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 that that's the more interesting direction here. Okay, so why are random subset phase states a pseudo-random state, right? So if we want to establish this, we need to prove two facts. First is that it's easy to construct these states, right? And secondly, we need to show that they're computationally indistinguishable from Haar random states, okay? So proving that these states are easy to construct is relatively straightforward, right? So let's say we want to prepare some subset state, right? Where we have some subset in mind S and some, you know, some uh, pseudo random function F. Uh, and let's, let's just assume that the subset that we're, we're considering is a size that's a power of two, okay? Well, the basic idea is that in order to prepare the state, you can first prepare, you know, it's very easy to prepare a superposition over some fixed subset, right? So for example, if I take my n qubits starting in all zeros and I just had a mark, the first f of n qubits of the state, you know, this prepares an equal superposition of some subset of states. It just happens to be a very simple to, to describe subset, right? It's all the strings that have zeros on the last n minus f of n bits and, and are every possible string on the first f of n bits, right? So it's very easy to prepare a fixed subset state, right? So in order to turn this into a pseudo-randomly chosen subset state, you know, we, we need to randomize the subset. And the basically the basic way that you can do this is by applying a, what's called a pseudo-random permutation pi to the subset in the manner that's called an in-place application. That's to say, we need some way of applying this permutation pi directly to the register, right? Like that, that you know, pi takes some string y and it outputs pi of y 
uh, in place, right? So this is applying a literal permutation of the computational basis states, right? If we can do that for a pseudo random permutation, pi, then this allows us to prepare an equal superposition over a pseudo random subset, right? Where our subset S is defined as the image of these strings Y followed by zeros under, under the pseudo random permutation, right? So of course, in order to do this, you know, the, the, there is a little caveat, like uh, in order to apply this permutation in place, uh, you need to be able, you know, there, there are some standard tricks in reversible computing that say you can do this if you can efficiently invert the PRP as well. And it turns out it, it, it is easily possible to do this with various, you know, it's kind of standard tricks from reversible computing, right? It's, it's really using the fact that you know the secret key that allows you to invert the permutation basically just by, by uncomputing and, and running it backwards, right? And then, you know, to, you know, you know, so now we're almost there. Like we have a superposition over the pseudo random subset. All we're missing is the phases, right? So in order to, to add the phases to the state, we now just apply our pseudo random function in, in superposition, just like was done in, in, in the JLS construction, right? So these states are kind of manifestly easy to prepare if the subsets are pseudo random and the phases are pseudo random. Great. So the more difficult part of the proof is to show that these pseudo random subset phase states are indistinguishable from har random states, right? So in order to prove this computationally indistinguishability property, uh, the proof follows two steps, right? So in the first step, we show that if our chosen phases and our chosen subsets were truly random, then, then the states that we produce would be statistically indistinguishable from HAR, right? So in other words, if, if your subset S was a truly random, you know, one of the different quasi-polynomially sized subsets of, of two to the N strings, then you would actually have prepared something that is statistically close or information theoretically close to, to the HAR measure, right? And in the second step of the proof, we then just replace all of the true randomness that we used in, in, in the truly random subset phase state, and we just replace it with pseudo randomness, right? And it then immediately follows that, you know, that this, our pseudo random phase, phase subset states are computationally indistinguishable from the truly random ones, right? And this implies that you're computationally indistinguishable from HAR by a hybrid argument, right? We are just considering one intermediate hybrid, right? The hybrid is truly random uh, subset phase states, right? So these are the two things that, that we need to show, right? Uh, and you know, the, the more difficult one of these to show is this first fact, which is that if the phases and subsets were truly random that 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 these states would be statistically close to har right and i'll give you a very brief sketch of of how you show this uh and the proof uses a lot of nice representation theory uh that 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 uh, that i'm happy to give like a a high level picture of right okay so let's say our goal now is to try to show that truly random subset phase states are close in trace distance to the Haar measure, right? So how are we going to show this? Well, it turns out that the density matrix of an unknown Haar random state has a very nice interpretation, right? It's actually just proportional to a projector onto the symmetric subspace of these systems, right? So in other words, if we take a Haar random state phi, right? And we consider taking T copies of that phi, and we look at that, you know, what is the density matrix that we obtain of that state? That density matrix is just equal to some projector pi onto the symmetric subspace of, of, of n-dimensional systems that you get from permuting, you know, and the, the symmetric subspace refers to permuting the T different copies, right? So it's just proportional up to this projector uh, up to some normalization. Right. So why is this true? This actually comes from some uh, well-known facts from sure wild duality. Like if you look at the set of symmetries of this density matrix, you know, it has 
two kind of natural symmetries. Like one symmetry is that, you know, because the Haar measure is invariant under applying any, uh, you know, capital N dimensional unitary to it, right? Then, uh, you know, applying the same unitary to each state, you know, to each copy preserves this density matrix. And similarly, because we're taking T copies of the same state, it's also invariant under permuting the action of permuting these T different copies. And effectively what's happening here is that when we're drawing a hard random state, we're kind of already building in this average over the unitary group. So all that's left in this state is the projector onto the, you know, the symmetric subspaces, the, the subspaces that are preserved by, by, by the symmetric group, right? Okay, great. So th this is just kind of a, 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 a well-known fact uh, that, that's, that's coming from representation theory, right? All right, great. So now when it comes to, you know, uh, you know, okay. So the second fact that, that we're going to use in this construction is that, you know, if you take random phase states, it turns out that random phase states are very close to the projector onto the symmetric subspace. So this was actually at the heart of G. Leo and Song and Berkursky and Shmueli's prior proof of, of the pseudo randomness of, of uh, random phase states. Like they followed a similar hybrid argument where they said, you know, let's first consider truly random phase states. And they showed by direct calculation that truly random phase states are actually close in trace distance to har random states, right? So we can just use this lemma kind of directly from their work, right? And what this means is that, you know, if you just take their lemmas and you import them into our context, it, 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 you end up getting a very similar lemma for random subset phase states that says something like this. So let, let, let me parse this. So this is a lot of notation. So let, let me parse this equation. We're saying like, let's say you fix a subset S of, of basis states. And now you consider random subset phase states where you draw our phase function F truly randomly, right? Then you can show using the techniques in these papers that, that uh, the trace distance between this state and the projector onto the symmetric subspace confined just to, the, to that subset S of basis states is very small. It's something, it's related, it's polynomial in the number of copies T and it's inverse, uh, you know, and you pick up a factor of, of one over the size of the subset. That, that, that you're considering, right? So this is just say, we just take their lemma and import it uh, to, to the case of a fixed subset S. Then, you know, the projector onto the symmetric space of that subset, it's a pretty good stand-in for, 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 our, for our random subset phase states, right? All right. So what this means is that, you know, if we want to show our random phase subset states are close to Har, our question just boils down to studying these different projectors, right? Like one, like our states look something like this. They're like a projector onto symmetric subsets of, 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 of S elements where we take an expectation over the choice of subset, right? Versus Haar random states, which is considering the projector onto all of the, the symmetric subspace on all of the n basis states at the same time, right? So our entire, you know, our entire problem basically boils down to asking, you know, how close are these two different, the these these two different states? One is a projector, the other is some sort of average over projectors where, where, where you average over the subsets. And the main technical part of our result is a new calculation. And 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 that we we sh we we show that these states are actually very close in trace distance, right? Actually, the distance between you know the 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 relevant symmetric projectors related to our state versus those of a Haar random state is something like uh, order of the number of copies squared divided by the size of the subsets that we're considering, right? Great. So, and the proof of this is 
a bit complicated. It uses this type enumeration met method of uh, Anant et al. who had a simplification of this, this trace distance calculation from uh, Berkowski Shmueli. And so, so see our archive version if you want to see kind of the, the full details of the proof. But it's really all about you know, doing this trace distance calculation very carefully. Right. So if we now put this together, right, like we showed that our random subset phase states are close to these projectors. And these projectors are then close to hard random states. We get the following statement by the triangle inequality. We get that the trace distance between truly random subset phase states and hard random states is upper bounded by this quantity. It's you know the number of copies squared over the size of the support of our subset, right? And this immediately give us, gives us what we want, right? This is a very strong lower bound, right? And, and this is a very strong upper bound because it's saying that as long as you choose the size of your subsets to be super polynomially sized, then this trace distance is an inverse super polynomial quantity, right? So it's saying that you can get away with relatively large, uh, sorry, relatively small subsets compared to what you might think you might need. Uh, to 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 achieve to achieve pseudo randomness. Great. And once we achieve this uh, this uh, statistical calculation, like this upper bound on the trace distance between truly random subset phase states and har, this immediately tells us that pseudo random subset phase states are computationally indistinguishable from har by a, a straightforward hybrid argument, right? So, you know, we just showed that har random states are information theoretically close to truly random subset phase states. Well, almost by the definition of pseudo randomness, this means that our pseudo random subset phase states are computationally indistinguishable from, from the truly random subset phase states. So if we just put these together, you know, this means that our pseudo random subset phase states have to be computationally indistinguishable for, from hard random states, which is the desired fact that, that we wanted to show. And the fact that we can get low entanglement here is coming from the fact that we can push our subset sizes to be you know, relatively small. Great. Now, for those of you who have seen uh, a prior version of this talk or a prior version of this paper, you might have noticed that uh, we actually switched pseudo-random state constructions compared to our old archive V1, right? Actually, in, in our original construction uh, that we uh, talked about at QIP, uh, all, what we showed is that there are pseudo-random states which have low entanglement across a single cut of the state using the binary phase state construction of, of prior works, right? So our, our prior construction used the original PRS constructions, right? Um, so what, 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 why did we switch away for, 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 from, from, that, from the original binary phase state construction? Well, it turns out that it is possible to generalize our, our prior construction with low entanglement slightly in the direction of achieving lower entanglement across more cuts. Like uh, you, you can actually show that you can, can obtain something called pseudo 1D area law, pseudo random states using our old construction um, by a, some proof that was like, you had to like repeatedly squash down the entanglement across many different cuts of the state. Um, we include the details in the appendix uh, of, of our new version that if you're, if you're interested. Uh, I'll discuss this pseudo 1D area law a little bit later in the talk. So I'm only giving it at a, at a high level here. But you know, the issue is that the, these prior this this construction was quite complicated and it didn't generalize, it, it, it didn't seem to generalize further to handle more sorts of cuts of a state, right? So our new subset phase state construction is actually kind of much nicer than, than our prior construction. Like because we're able to achieve now low entanglement across all cuts simultaneously. And the proof of this result is much simpler um, it, that, 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 than it is if, if you tried to do some, some, some similar things uh, with, with standard, standard binary phase states. And, and it gives you a stronger result because it achieves all cuts uh, at the same time. Okay, great. So, uh, 
yeah. So in some sense, you know, we, we've achieved this goal of defining some sort of pseudo entanglement, right? So, you know, our work is arguing that in some ways entanglement is not a feelable or polynomially time testable property of, of, of a quantum system, right? We're showing that given polynomially many copies of an n qubit state, you can't efficiently tell if it's highly entangled or not. And, you know, this, this is what, you know, inspired us to give this new definition of pseudo entanglement, right? Which is our ensembles of states, which are easy to construct, have very different entanglement, and nevertheless, no algorithm can efficiently uh, the, distinguish between them. All right. So, uh, uh, you know, we also give a formal definition of, 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 of this, this notion. Uh, as my time is running quite short, I might skip through the, the, the formal definition and point you to the paper if you're interested, but it's kind of, it's, it's exactly what you would expect. It's two ensembles of states that are, you know, it's easy to make them. They have different entanglement structures, um, but, but they're computationally indistinguishable from one another uh, in some way, right? So, you know, in, in our language, uh, you know, I mentioned there is this nice prior work of Georgiou and Hoban that inspired uh, our, our definition of pseudo-entanglement. So uh, in particular, what this prior work had achieved is they showed that if LWE is hard for quantum computers, then there's a way to hide a constant number of bits of entanglement uh, in the state. Like you can create some states which have n bits of entanglement entropy and another ensemble of states with n minus order one bits of entanglement entropy uh, where no efficient quantum algorithm can, can distinguish between the two, right? And our result is, is showing something very similar, but with a much larger gap in entanglement entropy, right? So we're showing that you can go from entanglement n to say something like entanglement log squared n and still hide this, hide, you know, and you, you can hide now an exponential amount of entanglement entropy while also being a pseudo-random state. And moreover, while doing it across all, you know, while, by, while reducing the entanglement across all cuts of the state uh, at, at the same time. Okay. So with my remaining kind of five or five, five to 10 minutes, I'll, I'll, I want to briefly discuss some sort of applications of, of our result, right? So, you know, we're defining this new notion of pseudo entanglement. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we hope that these are just kind of the tip of the iceberg and that uh, one will eventually find more, more applications of this notion in, in an analogous way to the fact that uh, pseudo randomness has found a large number of applications in classical computing. All right. But let, let, let me give one application of our result uh, in, in detail and then kind of sketch a few others, right? So it turns out that our new pseudo entanglement result uh, implies uh, a new lower bound for the problem called uh, matrix product state testing or MPS testing. Okay, so what is this problem? So matrix product states are an extremely useful subset of quantum states that's useful for studying quantum simulation and quantum Hamiltonian complexity, and they're used many places in quantum information. And the reason that they're so useful is that matrix product states are a subset of quantum states that are very easy to describe. Like they admit they have polynomial description complexity. And moreover, uh, it's also possible to efficiently compute with this description of states as well, right? So a matrix product state is parameterized by something called the bond dimension K, which in some sense, uh, it, formally, it's equal to the size of some sort of tensor that you place at each qubit of the state, right? And kind of what happens is, as you increase the bond dimension, then matrix product states end up describing a larger and larger family of a larger and larger subset of quantum states, right? And the you know one reason that matrix product states have been so useful is that they naturally obey something that's called an area law which is to say if you place your qubits on, on a line, right? And you consider you know, making a partition of your qubits into two different subsets, say the middle three qubits versus the outer qubits, right? And let's call the reduced density matrix on that state row, 
then you can show that for any matrix product state, the entanglement entropy of rho is upper bounded by the area of the cut. In other words, the number of edges of the 1D line that you cut with your partition times the log of your bond dimension K, right? Okay. And you know, there, there's a converse to this theorem as well, which is that any state that has a 1D area law also has a matrix product state as well. Uh, I know that this is shown in this uh, Vidal work, uh, though it it, it 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 might have an earlier uh, uh, pre predecessor as well. Okay, so the problem of matrix product state testing is to ask the following question: Given an unknown state, um, then is this unknown state either an n qubit k bond dimension MPS? Or is it far in trace distance from any such MPS, right? So this is a, a, a property testing-like problem. You're asking, does the state that you're given have the property of being a matrix product state or being very far from a matrix product state, right? So uh, relatively little was known about this property testing result until very recently. So in particular, uh, last year, uh, Solimanifar and Wright showed that MPS testing requires at least square root n copies of the state uh, in an information theoretic setting. Like, in other words, there exist some states they may or may not be efficient to prepare, uh, uh, such that testing of these states are an MPS or not is is actually very difficult, uh, even when the bond dimension k is is very low. Right. Now, an immediate corollary of our result is actually to show a complementary bound to this, to this recent uh, MPS testing bound. In particular, a, a corollary of, of our new pseudo-entanglement result is that MPS testing requires at least k to the one-half copies of the state, either information theoretically or computationally, right? So this is saying something very different, right? The prior bound said that MPS testing is hard even with a low bond dimension as you scale the number of qubits, our result is saying something different. If you take MPSs and you consider increasing the bond dimension of those states to bigger and bigger polynomials, or maybe even super polynomial size, the problem of MPS testing gets harder and harder. In fact, it scales polynomially with, with the bond dimension that, that you choose. And in fact, our, you know, our, our bound even holds in testing MPS states versus har random states, right? So what 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 what's the connection here? Well, remember that our states have very low entanglement entropy across any cut of the state. That actually immediately implies that our state have obey something called a a pseudo area law entanglement in one D, right? Because you know area law is just saying you have low entanglement for certain cuts. Well, we have low entanglement for all cuts at the same time. So of course we have one D area law entanglement. Right? You know, how big is, you know, so since our states have area law entanglement, this means our states also have some MPS description with some bond dimension that scales with the size of our subsets S, right? So our trace distance calculation actually immediately gives you the desired information theoretic bound on, on, on MPS testing. Just by considering, you know, our result is showing it's hard to tell these particular MPS states from hard random states, right? And we can do this either in an information theoretic setting or in a computational setting. Right. We have a few other applications in property testing, like to testing Schmidt rank um, and uh, some no-go results to, for efficient distillation. Uh, and I don't have time to talk about these, so I'll, I'll point you to the paper to see these. And finally, I want to end with a little more speculative note, which is that you know we think that these these uh, our new pseudo entanglement constructions might have something interesting to say about the complexity of of quantum gravity and the ADS CFT correspondence. So the ADS CFT correspondence is this just this conjectured duality between a quantum gravity theory like this object that theoretical physicists have been trying to construct for decades 
and a simpler, much simpler quantum mechanical system called the conformal field theory, which lives on the boundary of that theory. And the conjecture is that there's some dictionary map, which is some sort of homomorphism between these two theories that maps states in one theory to states in the other theory and operators in one theory to operators in the other theory. Right, so this is a really interesting thing because it's saying, you know, if you want to study quantum gravity, one way you might be able to do it is by studying this much simpler quantum mechanical system through this homomorphism. Right, and the major entanglement of uh, of this ADS-CFT correspondence is it's believed that the entanglement properties of the quantum mechanical theory correspond to geometrical properties of the quantum gravity theory. Like in other words, the entanglement of the quantum states that sit on the right-hand side of this duality is directly related to, to the, 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 the geometry of, you know, of, of the Einsteinian metric, which describes the space-time of your quantum gravity theory. Right? And our result is saying at a high level that entanglement uh, is something that's very difficult to feel or to observe to bounded polynomial time observers, right? But on the other hand, you know, the geometry of, of, of a gravitational metric feels like something that should be manifestly easy to compute, right? It feels like something, you know, if you were in the space time, you should be able to just kind of take, it, take out some ruler and, you know, me 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 measure certain distances. And ADS-CFT is saying those distances are connected to entanglement, okay? So this says something very interesting about quantum gravity because it, it's saying that, you know, if the corresponding geometry uh, is, is something that's efficiently measurable, then it's saying that this ADS-CFT dictionary that maps between the two theories has to be doing something that is exponentially complex, right? Because it's taking something that's very hard to observe, you know, like entanglement entropies, and making it something that's very easy to observe, like the length of some geodesics and in, in, in some gravitational theory. And you know, uh, this was actually indeed part of Giorgio and Hoban's motivation for this work. And you know, there is a uh, prior paper of myself and Bill Pfefferman and, and Umesh Vazarani that was arguing that that something like this might might occur already, right? But if 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 we were able to make this connection more rigorous, it would then end up saying that the 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 complexity, you know, the, the high complexity of quantum gravity is coming from a very fundamental property of the correspondence rather than some of the particular elements that, that, that we used in the, the original paper to try to argue for hardness of the dictionary. So I think this is a really interesting kind of potential application uh, of our results that I'm looking forward to discussing more uh, momentarily. All right, so let, let, let me wrap up now. So what have we seen in this talk? You know, we define this new notion called pseudo entanglement, and we showed that you can efficiently spoof very entangled quantum states with relatively little entanglement, you know, even with states that have low entanglement across all cuts of the state simultaneously. And I think, you know, there are a large number of open problems here that, that I, 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 I think are, are, are really interesting. Like, you know, one of the ways we made progress on this construction was by giving a new pseudo-random state construction based on these subset states. Right, so I, I think there are really interesting questions to ask, you know, if, if, if there are other sorts of PRS constructions lying out there, they might have even different sorts of entanglement properties, right? Uh, second, I think there's a lot of uh, potential for applications of these sorts of ideas to physics. Like for example, our states have this sort of like 1D pseudo area law entanglement. And in condensed matter theory, one often associates things like area law entanglement with, say, uh, different phases of, of quantum matter, right? So th there might be some potential applications to, you know, maybe arguing that it might be hard to learn certain phases of matter. Um, yeah, I, I think that could be a really interesting direction, as well as trying to uh, flush out some of these ideas uh, about tr trying to connect our states with uh, with quantum gravity, like for example, can you make pseudo random states 
that have entanglement structures that look like the states that appear in quantum gravity. Actually, in some sense in our construction, we overshot, like, uh, like we just cut our entanglement across all cuts way down to almost nothing. But the states that are usually present in these quantum gravity theories have like a kind of area law or super area law, but sub volume law entanglement structure. So to answer this question, we would actually need to dial up the entanglement of pseudo random states rather than dial it down. Finally, you know, there's a nice question of if we can create some new sort of like cryptographic primitives uh, out of these, these sorts of states. You know, I've been giving a lot of no-go results for applications, but there's some natural questions of having low entanglement PRSs, you know, might, might enable some new sorts of applications. And of course, there's the question of if we can make a more near-term implementable version of these states. At the moment, they're 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 constructed with general one-way functions, so they're they're not. Um, it, it, it's it's not obvious that that these would be amenable to in this device. All right, thanks thanks so much for your time and thanks for your indulgence for going a few minutes over. Great, great, thank you, thanks, Adam. Um, great talk. So. Um... Uh, are there any questions before we move to the panel? Oh yeah, Norbert. Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me? How's it going? Good, thanks. Uh, great talk. Um, so I, I, I was wondering for these matrix product states, which can't be distinguished from super highly entangled states, do you know how these states actually look like? Like what is the form of these yeah, matrix products? Yeah, that's a states? great question. Uh, I don't know what they look like. Uh, and uh, the the thing that I think is challenging, like, okay, there is some induced distribution on them, right? Because an MPS exists. So given our states, you, yeah, as you're saying, like you can in principle convert them to MPSs, but I, I have no idea what, what that distribution looks like. And uh, it, I, I would guess it's not a natural distribution um, just because we, we initially tried making sorts of pseudo random states out of things like random MPSs or random PEPs, but they, they turned out not 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 to be good candidates for mm -hmm. reasons we I can discuss more if you're interested. Uh, so yeah, they, it it might be some it's some very weird distribution of MPSs that I think would be induced. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a there's a question in the Q and A by Luen. Uh, I'll allow him to talk and ask the question directly. So do you want to go ahead? Hi, um, I'm wondering. Um, like whether there is a simpler construction of pseudo entanglement that uses like just pseudo entropy instead of using um, some variant of pseudo random states. So for example, you can consider a PRG and then like its output will have Shannon, very low Shannon entropy, which means that if you look at the purified picture, it will also have low, um, Entanglement entropy as well, right? So wouldn't this like gives a more simple? Oh, that's that, that's a great question. So the idea would be something like uh, you take the pseudo random phase state construction, and then instead of picking the key uniformly at random, you then uh, no wait wait sorry I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm yeah I, I I'm I'm not sure immediately. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, It's not immediately clear because the, uh, yeah, okay. If you take a pseudo random state and then you just replace the key with the output of a PRG or something like that. No, no, no. I, I'm um, not it talking... should be indistinguishable, but that doesn't translate to low entanglement, right? So I, I, I think your idea is something else. Uh, can you say it again? Sorry. Yeah. My idea is that you take um, a PRG, you pick some random input and then you run the PRG, and then you look at the entropy of the output. Mm -hmm. Then you will have like essentially very low Shannon entropy, and therefore it will also have low entanglement entropy. How do you turn the PRG into a quantum state? So if you just put, if you use the PRG to describe the like phases of the state, the exponential- No, 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 there's no phases. The state, yeah, or... actually I want to, well, I'm like the only quantum part of this is just a uh, like the the input generation. Like you you 
prepare. And you're saying this is a distribution on classical, like your strings yeah. are just classical yeah. strings. Exactly. Well, our mm -hmm. statement is that any element of the ensemble. Oh, I see. So th those strings always have low entanglement. Um, yeah, I, so, I don't so even Adam, see how this works. We, we 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 might need to take this offline, or or I'd I, I'd be happy to discuss further. So, so Adam, may, maybe this is this is along the lines of the JLS uh, conjecture about um, wouldn't, wouldn't, the, wouldn't this be? Uh, oh yeah, you know, which is which is the superposition of a pseudo random strings. Oh oh, just a superposition over pseudo random yeah. strings. Oh so yes, this seems this seems analogous. Yeah, if you took an equal superposition over pseudo random strings. You know, that would be basically our construction without the phases, right? So it would be simpler. And uh, yeah, it, it's a great question. Yeah, J JLS constructed, conjectured, you might be able to make something like this work. Uh, uh, in principle, there's some really hard trace distance calculation you could do uh, that if, if you could if you could perform it, uh, like show the trace distance between random subset states and har random states is 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 you know inverse super polynomially small. Like if you could do that, then 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 you you, you would immediately get I I think the result that you're looking for. Uh, but uh, yeah, no that, that 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 that's a great open problem, and we don't know yet if if that's true or not. So yeah, like just do random subset states already work. Um, Andrew, I guess. Um... Should be on the, yeah, yeah. I, you want to I just had a follow up to this. I'm I wasn't sure if I should save it for the panel, but um, so for these random subset states, if you're only interested in showing pseudo entanglement but not pseudo randomness, mm -hmm. um, would you be able to do that? Because I, as I understand it from your construction, the problem was not being able to show pseudo randomness without adding the phases. But if you only want this like tunable oh, entanglement, yeah, that's property. a great question. Cause then you're you're never trying to connect it to the symmetric subspace on everything. Right. You're only talking about two different averages over different subspaces. Uh, right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um yeah, I don't know. Like it okay, it it's not uh, you know, the phases were very important for us for turning the question into a, a question about projector onto any symmetric subspaces at all, right? Because that, that's what connects you to har random states. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's a great question. You 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 might be able to do that, but I I I don't know if it works off the top of my head. Yeah. Thanks. I there would be some sort of representation theory calculation you could do because there are symmetries of the state, but it, it's a different symmetry group. So uh yeah. It, it might boil down to some some question like that. Right. Thanks. Okay. Let, let's see. There's a question from the. Uh, let me let me allow Eliana to talk. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, it's uh, near actually. And um, so I have a question. And um, if you replace the PRP by just having a X and then a kid PRF uh, with X. Could that work? And then instead of using a PRP, we only use a PRF. Yeah. Oh, you're asking if, if I could replace the PR, sorry, could, can you elaborate again how you would replace the PRP with a PRF? Yeah, instead of calculating a pi of X, Mm -hmm. uh, have x comma uh, some PRF of x, mm -hmm. which also gets you a random subset. Yeah. Um, I think you would end up with high entropy, wouldn't you? If you if you keep x there. Well, X is I... still not high. Like mm. X is still of the uh, omega log n uh, mm. size. Oh, I see. So you would just say uh, oh, if you see. had these strings y zero, you just replace the zero with some PRG of X or something like that. Uh, sorry, sorry, P yeah, PRG exactly. of Y. 
or something like oh, okay. so you 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 keep the initial subset um yeah i think that would probably work yeah that's okay, a, yeah that, that that's an interesting suggestion i'll i'll think through the details but my my initial guess is that 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 would work right. we we just want the subset to be pseudo random we don't really care like you you you're correct we aren't using like all of the power of a prp here right we're just applying something once right yeah so yeah yeah, like oh, we're only using it as as a way of defining, you know, the image of y zero to the n minus f of n is is our pseudo random set. If that's all we're using, then yeah, that's a great. So maybe we can just replace it with the PRF. Yeah, yeah thanks. Hey, thanks thank for you. Thanks. Hey, so um, Adam, would you like to stop sharing your slides so we can go sure. to the panel? Okay, great. So um, um, let's see. Let's. Um, so we have a we have a fantastic panel uh, today. Um, so um, let me introduce the panelists. Uh, we have uh, Netta Engelhardt from MIT. Um, she's one of the co-winners of the New Horizons Prize for her uh, for um, her work on. Um, uh, leading to the resolution of the black hole information paradox. So very, uh, um, very appropriate for this connection to uh, between between entanglement and, and uh, black holes. Uh, we have uh, Andrew Georgiou uh, from the, from Chalmers, uh, Chalmers University in Sweden. So uh, Andrew uh, works on um, on uh, um, on all aspects of uh, of um, uh, quantum and crypto, and you know, as you heard from Adam, he he uh, he did this work uh, on pseudo entanglement, or uh, uh, you know, uh, exploring entanglement and and, and uh, cryptographic constructions. And then we have uh, Yikai Liu from uh, University of Maryland. Uh, Yikai is also the co-director of Quix there, the Quantum Institute there. And uh, Yikai has worked, you know, works extensively on um, on both uh, post quantum cryptography as well as uh, um, new cryptographic constructions, including um, including pseudo random quantum states. So um, I guess um, I'll I'll just uh, turn to the panelists and say, you know, give you a chance to um, to air your views about the talks. Uh, uh, Netta, would you like to start or? Uh, sure. Uh, well, uh, thanks, Adam. That was uh, super enlightening and super interesting. Um, so I guess my comments will be, since I'm mostly learning with the, the other stuff, uh, my comments will be mostly on the quantum gravity applications, which are uh, uh, very interesting. So I would actually think that um, one thing that we can get from, a from ADS-CHT for uh, quantum computing and quantum information and, uh, and understanding pseudo entanglement uh, is actually using the fact that entanglement should never be feelable in ADS CFT um, just on account of causality in gravity. So uh, basically, causal structure arguments in gravity would have to imply that it's it should essentially always be uh, impossible to feel the uh, to, to measure in a causal way in a simple way. The, um, the area of an extremal surface, so it's general entropy of a quantum extremal surface. And so I think if we sort of take that as, as a prior that, you know, the causal structure of gravity is valid in ADS-CFT, which we, we tend to do, um, then instead, I think what we can say is, um, is we can ask what are those pseudo entangled states look like in, uh, in holography? And as you were giving the talk, I, I built a couple on a piece of paper. So, um, so I think I can, I, I can uh, tell you what those are. And those are essentially um, states where you have one of these, uh, where a spatial slice of the space time essentially um, looks like one of those Python's lunches. It has, it's gonna have some kind of a constriction and then it's gonna sort of have a, a larger part of the space time behind it. And uh, I think what, what we can, essentially say about those is that for all holographic pseudo entangled states, um, those are always going to be computationally indistinguishable 
from something like a generalized Gibbs ensemble, which is not like the same thing as saying that they're pseudo random, but it's actually kind of close. And it, it, so I think that potentially the, ne the next obvious thing is maybe to actually be able to show in holography that um, pseudo random, so pseudo entangled states are actually computationally indistinguishable from hard random whenever they're holographic. Uh, and I, my understanding is that uh, you, you, don't, you don't know that that's true in general for pseudo entangled states, that they're always going to be pseudo random. You, you proved it in your case for the old construction, but it, it, ADS-CFT would seem to suggest that maybe this is actually something which is um, true in general. This, I, I, can, I can come up with the proof for you kind of um, very quickly that it's going to be true for all holographic states. That's my two cents. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, should, should, uh, shall we go through go. the panelists first? Yeah, okay, okay, so I'll, I'll hold my call. Or, or you could comment now if you like. Uh. Well, I, yeah, I, there's, th for, th thanks so much like this. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting connection um, that, uh, so if I understand correctly, you're saying that like basically the right reference ensemble for you is the generalized Gibbs distribution. Like that's what would be most interesting to spoof in, in the quantum gravity context rather than hard random states, just because hard random states don't have a nice gravitational interpretation. That's right. It's so basically something like a generalized uh, thermal state. So it doesn't have to be the Gibbs ensemble and specifically, I was kind of going for something concrete, mm -hmm. but in general, the thing that we, that, that we understand geometrically uh, and will understand as being uh, something that is indistinguishable if you have uh, pseudo entanglement, is going to be one of those states that we can get using the Jane's type for screening, where we'll fix some expectation values of some observables and we'll maximize the von Neumann entropy subject to fixing those expectation values. Mm -hmm. And those states, mm -hmm. we perfectly understand the, ge the geometric duals. And those will be exactly those states mm -hmm. that our pseudo entangled states in ADSCFT are indistinguishable from. Ah, okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah, I would love to hear more about the candidate constructions because yeah, I think like what yeah, as I mentioned, like our our currently our pseudo entangled states they don't have like CFT like or like nice nice geometrical construction. You know, they're they're coming from this theoretical computer science avenue, so they they don't kind of naturally have interpretation. So like the but fact I that you already other, have it on the spot. <laughs> So, I can so, yeah, the, the fact you already have an on the spot uh, uh, interpretation is 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 really interesting. So I can give you one very concrete one, which is uh, which I can construct sort of also in the um, in the in the full quantum gravity theory, like in a CFT, if you will. So mm -hmm. I would expect that the, the so the Hawking state for a black hole that's evaporating after the page time, that's going to be a state which looks like it's very uh, well. The Hawking state itself is maximally entangled with some auxiliary system which does not live in the universe. So if you include the auxiliary system in you know universe tensor this auxiliary system, then you have a pure state which is which is maximally entangled. And mm -hmm. if you look at the actual state of the black hole or the radiation, uh, which is purifying, then it's going to be essentially barely and not entangled with the reservoir with this mm -hmm. auxiliary system. Uh, but it you know it's computationally indistinguishable from the Hawking state. So that's another example of a state that comes up very naturally in quantum gravity, which I think is pseudo entangled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it would be really cool if what could uh, formalize this and make a new pseudo entangled candidate construction that's purely phrased in quantum gravity terms. Like that would yes. that would be that would be really cool. So, yes, I, I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you, Meta. Um, Andrew, did you did you want to follow up? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. So thanks, Adam, for the really nice talk. Um, so I guess maybe I'll, I'll comment a bit on uh, the, let's say the computational and the crypto aspects of, of the construction. Um, so, you know, when, when you started the talk, you started with this um, like interesting motivation of with classical computation, we can view randomness as a sort of resource um, to, you know, like speed up solving certain problems. Um, but then people kind of understood that this actually seems to be a sort of mirage because we should be able to de-randomize um, algorithms. And similarly, it seems like entanglement is a resource for quantum computation, but as you mentioned, like it doesn't seem like we can dequantize quantum algorithms. Um, so I think it would be interesting from that perspective to see if um, like what computational insights can we get from these pseudo-random states um, so for instance, you know, like there, there was some recent work by, um, 
well, a subset of the authors of, of your paper um, showing like an interesting computational phase transition when you look at graph states, like certain cluster states that are used for measurement-based quantum computing. Um, and that like when you measure these cluster states at random angles, the distribution sampled from by this measurement can be easy or hard to sample from depending on the connectivity of these graph states. So I'm wondering if there's like an analogous thing that one could consider for either these pseudo-random phase states or um, just like general pseudo-entangled states in general, like if that tells us anything interesting about computation. Um, and then on, on the cryptographic side, um, so I find it really interesting that this pseudo-entanglement notion really seems to be a distinct notion from pseudo-random states in the sense that you can have pseudo-random states uh, which are maximally entangled, so they're not, you know, pseudo-entangled, um, like they're not really hiding the, their entanglement in, a, in that sense. Um, and you can also have, um, like you can also have it in, in the other direction as well. Um, so you can have pseudo-entangled states which are not pseudo-random. Um, so pseudo-random states we kind of know, especially with a number of recent works, that they lead to interesting cryptographic applications. So people have used them to construct commitment schemes, digital signatures, and so on. Um, and yet there's evidence to suggest that pseudo-random states can exist even in a world where one-way functions do not exist, which is like really exciting for cryptography. Um, and so this also brings up the question of like what is where does pseudo entanglement fit into this picture? So if you care about ensembles of states that are pseudo entangled but maybe not necessarily pseudo random themselves, um, where does this fit into the picture? A kind of related question would be: Can you always map from a family of pseudo random states to a family of pseudo entangled states, or vice versa? Um, and finally, like uh, in in kind of relation to uh, to my work with with Matty Hoban. Um, I think like one interesting distinction between the pseudo entangled states that you talked about and, and what we did in our paper um, was that in our paper, you're also given the circuit that produces the states. And even when you're given the circuit, like you know what circuit produced the states, you still can't tell if the state is um, has large or small entanglement. Um, so this made me think that maybe there's, this is like a type of public key pseudo entanglement and, and your version is like a private key um, type of pseudo entanglement. And again, this makes me wonder like what, in, in what context is one useful? Um, and like, it, you know, it seems like the private key version can obviously be based on weaker assumptions than the public key version. Um, also in relation to ADS-CFT, I, I was also thinking like, is, is one notion more meaningful than the other? Like, in ADS-CFT, does it matter if you know the circuit that produces the state, or you know, is it just the state, them, the states themselves that we care about and their entanglement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's yeah, I uh, yeah, I'll 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 reply. Thank, thanks for the excellent comments. So I'll start with your last question and then I'll unwind it. So. Um, sure. So yeah, you know, it's a great question. If you want like a public key, it, you, you are absolutely correct in that our construction is a private key construction and you can ask about a public key construction. And I think that a public key construction would be uh, directly applicable. Like it would give you a new application to this question about learning phases of matter, right? So the, the reason is that uh, like, okay, let's say like in the physics context, like the more natural input to their problem is not, given copies of the state, but they want to be say, given the description of a local Hamiltonian, they want to ask the question, is the ground state of this local Hamiltonian, does it have like area law entanglement or volume law entanglement, right? So if you could prove a lower bound, you know, if you could create, I, I think if you could create a public key version of pseudo entanglement with kind of 1D area law entanglement, it would immediately imply this uh, like a, a lower bound for, for this problem, right? And the reason is that you could just use like the Kataev clock construction to go from the uh, from the circuit description that prepares the state, which either has lots or little entanglement to some Hamiltonian whose ground state uh, in, encodes that state up, up to some amount of error, right? So I think mm -hmm. that, that that's the reason like, 
our, our work doesn't yet imply that hardness of learning phases of matter is that we have a private key construction. If we give you the circuit for the state, uh, it, it gives away the whole problem. Like you could immediately tell uh, that 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 we're fooling you, but by uh, you know just doing some swap test by making your own copies of it or something like this. So some sort of uh, and yeah, and like if you similarly if you if you do the Feynman Kitayev, uh sorry, if you do the Kitayev clock construction to turn a state with a circuit into a Hamiltonian, it kind of copies the, the secret key in plain text, basically. Like you could immediately right. read it from the Hamiltonian. So I, I think your latter suggestion would like, is, is, is really interesting and it might give you this connection to phases of matter. Uh, I don't immediately know how it connects to ADS CFT. That's, that's a great question as to whether uh, a, a public key version might be more interesting. Um, I mean, it, it, it might change some of the connection to this Python's lunch story that Neda was mentioning, where part of the hardness is coming from some degrees of freedom you're tracing out over, which for us are the secret keys of, 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 of the crypt cryptographic construction. I, yeah, that's something I find really interesting to discuss. Um, yeah, great. In terms of... Uh, yeah, okay. So getting back to some of your other comments, yes, pseudo-entanglement could actually be something completely different from pseudo-randomness. Like you can definitely make pseudo-random states that are not pseudo-entangled. Um, and uh, you can hide some amount of entanglement without being pseudo-random. I guess I don't yet know of a construction that hides an exponential amount of pseudo, uh, uh, an exponential amount of entanglement and is not pseudo random. I would guess you could construct something like that because that that should be like the easy, the easier direction. Like it's easier to take something pseudo random and mess up its pseudo randomness property than vice versa. But yeah, I, I, I that would be cool. Like I agree that in principle there should be some sort of formal separation there. Um, that would be interesting. Um, yeah, and in terms of your first question about you know spoofing different sorts of entanglement, yeah, I agree. Like a, a cluster state would be a very natural place to start. You know, it's a very particular sort of entanglement there. If you could make a low entangled version of of a, of a cluster state, then that would imply a dequantization of some sort of family of quantum algorithms, right? So, I, I, you know, fully spoofing a cluster state is probably like far too much to hope for, right? Because that would you know that would presumably dequantize a wide swath or or maybe all quantum algorithms that that that's too much to hope for but it would be cool if there would be uh, it would be very interesting if there were some like subset of quantum algorithms that were like a natural target of like okay what what's the next thing that would that we might hope to dequantize uh with with with, with something like this so yeah that or, yeah, those are or, great or you could also go in the other direction of no go results and say you know because of this you can't dequantize certain certain constructions. Oh, like, yeah, there does not exist a way of making right. pseudo entanglement like this. Un oh, unless see. some cryptographic assumption is broken. Mm. Yeah. I see, I see, interesting. Um, sorry, um, sorry, Andrew, I didn't understand this last point. So you're saying um, in terms of dequantizing, you would, you would say uh, under cryptography, right. you cannot dequantize. So how, how would you see that going? Oh, so yeah, I guess it's just a, a vague argument, but the idea would, was that um, if um, if you could somehow dequantize an algorithm that uses a small amount of entanglement, and at the same time you can show that in place of that state that is like low has low entanglement, you could use a pseudo random state, um, then that should give some sort of contradiction, like it would mean that then you can break the, the underlying cryptographic assumption. Mm. Okay. At least, yeah. Yeah, or yeah, or if you dream up some stronger cryptographic primitive that maybe we don't know if it exists or not, and you show that implies you can spoof a cluster state, then uh, yeah, that that should imply that 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 uh, stronger crypto primitive shouldn't exist because otherwise it would give a right. you know, a quasi poly time factoring mm -hmm. algorithm or something like this, right? Right. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, Ikai, um, uh, it's been you had to wait for a bit, but uh, looking forward to your comments. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So so Adam, thank you for this, this nice talk. I think it's a very cool result. Um, so I think 
I think many of the things that I find interesting about this have, have already been said by, by the other panelists, but maybe I can riff on some of those themes a little bit. Um, you know, so, you know, so, so I'm also interested in this idea of when you look at special classes of quantum states, then how can you spoof those by taking advantage of this computational indistinguishability? You know, so, um, so, you know, like one example that kind of interests me is PEP states for two dimensional uh, local Hamiltonians. So these are intuitively, these are meant to, to describe the ground states of two dimensional mm -hmm. sort of quantum materials. And, and I think this is an interesting class of states because these are really not computationally tractable the way matrix product states are. But at the same time, they still have a lot of structure that's very different from our random states. You know, and, and so, yeah, I think it's an interesting question whether a class of states like these could be spoofed by some other states that are computationally indistinguishable from them, but actually have very different properties. You know, part of me doesn't really want this to be true, because if it's true, it kind of, it kind of is a big problem for, for our physical understanding of, of PEP states and 2D quantum systems. But, you know, but I think it's an interesting kind of foundational question. Um, and, you know, like, I guess another class of states that interests me is, is states that can be prepared by shallow quantum circuits. And so these, you know, and so these are the kinds of states that arise in, in near term demonstrations of quantum supremacy. And, you know, and so we can imagine trying to prepare these states on noisy quantum computers. And we know that these states are really you know, quite different from the states that we hope to someday prepare on proper fault tolerant quantum computers. So they're really special, but at the same time, they're also really not classically tractable. And so there, and so I think it's interesting to ask, um, could these states possibly be spoofed by very different looking states or by states that have very different structure, but still look the same in the sense of computational indistinguishability? Yeah, and, you know, and so, um, so I think, you know, I think that, that the results you've described kind of give the first indication that there could be interesting answers to these questions at all as well. Um, and yeah, I guess, you know, one, one last comment I have is that, um, you know, so, um, so, so I and my co-authors, um, Zhang Fengji and Fang Song, like when we were, when we were working on this paper, this, the, the JLS paper from 2018, um, for us, we, you know, it was kind of, we wrote the paper thinking that this was something that, you know, that this notion of a pseudo random state, someone ought to define it because it seemed like a natural thing. You know, just if you look at, if you look at the foundations of classical cryptography, there are pseudo random generators. And so we felt that this was really a fundamental object that, that we were talking about, but we weren't really sure what it would be used for. And it's, you know, and it's so, and so personally, it's very nice, you know, for me to see that it has found some uses. Um, from my point of view, like I actually wanted this to be a step towards constructing a more complicated object called a, a pseudo random unitary. And so this would be a, a, a unitary operation that would appear pseudo random. And the pseudo random state was somehow, was somehow just the first step to, towards constructing a pseudo random unitary. You know, like another way you can think of it is that is constructing a pseudo random unitary object is like constructing an orthonormal basis where every state in that basis is pseudo random. And we have some candidate constructions for this. But we could never prove that they were secure. And yeah, and, and so I, you know, I thought quite a bit about this in the years after, but didn't make much progress with it. Um, I think, I think my co authors did too. And yeah, and, and so um, I'm not as optimistic about, about solving that problem, but I still think it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so again, you know, um, Echoing my other the fellow panelists, um, it's a really cool thing to be working on.
Yeah, great. Thanks so much for your comments. Yeah, I, I agree that probably after you wrote your pseudo random state paper, you probably were not expecting one of the first applications to be uh, the ADS CFT correspondence. But uh, that, that no, no. happens to be how it uh, <laughs> how it played out. Uh, uh, so uh, it's like you know, in in some sense, when when you know, my collaborators and I were thinking about the complexity of ADS CFT, uh, you know, we were hearing all this talk about complexity equals volume, and when you hear complexity is equal to something physical, you immediately think about you know, natural proofs barrier and 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 pseudo randomness barriers to separating p versus np, just how we started down this kind of pseudo random state uh, direction. So anyway, so yeah, it very directly kind of inspired some of our work and, and really fed into that. Um, yeah, the the question you mentioned about how to construct the pseudo random unitary, it's it's a really great one. I think it's pretty difficult um, in terms of uh, like I I guess what what one thing one might hope is like one could dream that somehow having lower entanglement PRSs might 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 help you in this, but I I still don't see a direct connection. So I think well, that this well, is... you know you know Adam, one we we could think about uh, instead. I mean, it might be hard to create a pseudo random unitary, but it might be easier to create a pseudo entangled unitary. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like one that uh, produces, looks like it makes a lot of entanglement, but but doesn't. Yes. Hmm, interesting. And then, yeah, that, okay, interesting. Yeah, that would, that would be a totally orthogonal notion to a PRU. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's an interesting suggestion. Um, yeah. Uh, with regards to some of your earlier uh, kind of comments, uh, first you asked, you know, is it possible to make some sort of shallow quantum circuit version of our construction? It, you know, I, I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I think it, it could be possible. You know, like this is in Andrew and Maddie Hoban's prior work, that was a lot of the focus of their result is, is getting these things down to log depth with log depth LWE constructions. Now, I do mean to ask though, is the most relevant notion of locality that you're talking about like spatial locality, or do you mean like, uh, you know, lo log depth with all to all connectivity? Do you... Um... I guess I'd be interested in both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think if it's all to all connectivity and log, log or poly log depth, yeah, I, I I do wonder if there's a way of making it work uh, with what with, with, with LWE. Uh, Andrew, you you might have more uh, media comments on this. So this is something you you've thought thought a lot about. So. Yeah, I, I guess um, probably if you use. Uh, PRG constructions that that are based on LWE. I imagine you could compress that down to to log depth. Um, I mean, th there's this uh, this nice paper on uh, how you can take cryptographic primitives that can be performed in in log depth and then turn them into constant depth, but then you get unbounded fan out with the with the constant depth circuit, um, and that becomes a bit unfortunate in in the quantum case. But merely for log depth, I, I think an LWE based construction should work. Yeah. Ah, and, and this would be log depth all, all to all connectivity. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure about, yeah, like uh, sp spatial locality as well. Um, may, maybe that's also doable. Um, but yeah, definitely with uh, with like all to all connectivity, I think it should be possible. Yeah, yeah it it could be that trying to ask if you can do it with uh, locality might be like uh, you know th this is something uh, you know I've discussed quite a bit with with Bill and Umesh. Like it, it it might require you doing something like defining a new notion of of LWE that has spatial locality kind of baked in, whereas it. it the 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 vanilla the off the shelf LWE is 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 not like that right in any obvious way. So. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. When when you start looking at at very restricted kinds of quantum circuits, then it really it introduces a lot of technical complications. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And yeah, and, and yeah, I also I'll comment a little bit. You asked, you know, is there any connection to PEPs? 
Uh, yeah, I think it, it's a really nice question. At you know, I think all I can say is that you know, once you have a, a quasi one D area law construction that has an MPS, you know, it does give you uh, a state that has like a quasi two D area law PEPS. Uh, pseudo randomness construction directly by just snaking your 1D uh, pseudo area law, you know, across the 2D plane, right? So we we can say that there are states with PEPs or 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 you know any finite dimensional pseudo area law that are that that are pseudo random as well. I mean, this might not be directly what you're looking for though, because we just would then have an upper bound on the entanglement of these states that it's at most like a PEPs. Um, it wouldn't like the the states you get would not have peps like entanglement in the sense that well they would actually have the entanglement of a one d snake snaking through your space like they're actually much less entanglement in like horizontal directions than in vertical directions and uh, asking if you could make more peps like pseudo randomness would be asking uh, it's again an analogous question can you increase the entanglement entropy in in, in certain directions re relative to the low entanglement. Uh, versions we constructed. So yeah, I, I think that's a really nice question. Yeah, and so I, I think I'm I think I'm also interested in a slightly different question, which is, um, can you can you make states that are computationally indistinguishable from PEP states, but have a very different sort of internal structure? So um, so I'm I'm not sure exactly how to formalize it. But, which, which is making oh, me a little so nervous. So, like your canonical ensemble could be something like a random peps, yeah, or something for like that. And you want to say, I want some ensemble states with different entanglement, but are yeah computationally indistinguishable from yeah. That that's very interesting. Yeah, for instance, like like we can probably agree on on what a random pep state is, like on on mm -hmm. a mathematical definition of that. And and I'm sort of curious, um, can there be other ensembles? That are computationally indistinguishable from that, but but have very different entanglements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's a really nice question. It's it's really different than the pseudo randomness question because yeah, the entanglement structure there is different. They have decay of correlations and all sorts of other sorts of properties that. Uh, yeah. That, uh, yeah. And and so like like for matrix product states. Um, we know how to answer this question because for constant bond dimension, you can do tomography of an of a matrix product state efficiently. And so, and so therefore, kind of there's no ambiguity about matrix product states. Even when you throw in computational, even when you force the observer to be computationally bounded. Sort of a polynomial time observer can completely characterize a matrix product state mm -hmm. without ambiguity. But that's not true for PEP states. You know, like a polynomial time observer cannot completely characterize an unknown PEP state. And therefore, there's some possibility of that computational indistinguishability mm -hmm. could imply that there's something weird going on. That, you know, the state that you think is a PEP state actually it really isn't. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And, and yeah, I guess, and the point is that occurs even at low bond dimension. Of course, with an MPS, if you blow up the bond dimension to be like super polynomial, then you can start saying things about indistinguishability. Yeah. And that, that's kind of implicitly what, what, what we're doing in our work, right? Yeah. Um, like, so like but, that, uh, like, but, yeah. but yeah, but things get interesting at low bond dimension with PEPs in the way that, yeah, they don't with MPS mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. 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 So I guess what, yeah, like your results already show that like for matrix product states with um, polylog bond dimension? Uh, it would be quasi-poly. Quasi-poly yeah. bond dimension. Yeah, yeah. yeah if, it's, if it's poly bond dimension, you the, the tomography attack you mentioned would, uh -huh. would, would still work. Or, or you can see it another way, just it follows directly from your entanglement lower bound. Like the Schmidt rank across the cut is at most the bond dimension. If that's only polynomial, then that means there's like a, you know, like if you do a swap test of two copies, first half of two copies, the states you would have a one over poly bias uh, from that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry for for getting this a bit too technical. No, that was that was great. Um, and, and any other any other questions or, or any other thoughts? 
No, thank, thank you all for a really great discussion, uh, Neta, uh, Andrew, uh, Ikai, and of course, uh, Adam. And, uh, and thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, uh, I'll see you again next week. Great, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for a great discussion. Bye. Thanks a lot, this was really fun, bye-bye. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks Neta. Bye. bye.